Hello, welcome to the Augur meeting, uh, October 21st, 2024. And uh, don't have a big agenda today, but uh, I think uh, Kelly might have some use case questions. Yeah, um, the first one is going to be on the pull request um, reviews table. Um, since I can only speak to the, like the Padres and since the one that I work on, but for, I guess, over now, we haven't been able to do, like, a simple query on it, so it seems like there might be more to it than just, like, dense collection. Yeah. The, uh, yes, you shared your query with me at some point, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it's genuine. It's select on repo ID for like, I, mean, I was just trying like the simplest query on the um, table and that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a instance specific tuning problem that I have to sort out. So we can, let's do some troubleshooting on that. Um, sounds good. Yeah, we'll need to set up, need to set up some time to kind of look at it. Um, uh, with auger down and, um, yeah, so I, I need to run some stuff on that server. Okay. Possibly. Um, Today would be a good day for that. If okay. we end up having time, um, a more general question would be to go through those, um, like the data, like or it's like pretty much the metrics that I sent over in chat, and trying to see like what, how to parse Augur from like an SQL Sam, like from like a query standpoint to be able to get that data or if it's only by API, but at least to talk through it, it kind of seemed like it might be something like that you like that is not like out of the box auger. Yeah, well, let's take a look because um, you were asking questions about licensing, right? Yeah, there's two uh, metrics from that are linked from the chaos website that yeah. I was looking to try to replicate. Yeah. Oops. I can spell auger. So uh, license coverage. So this is the endpoint for license coverage. And the other one was OSI approved licenses. While you're looking that up, I have a question for Callie. Um, because of the way eight knot is is structured, do you does it make more sense for you to use the API like what Sean's showing here, or does it make more sense for eight knot to do the database queries directly? Database queries directly. So is this is this helpful for you to have the API? I mean, at this point, I don't, I guess we're starting from, this is the yeah. only thing that so, being able to access it. I don't even know if it's available via query. Well, to write the endpoint, someone had to write the query, right? Yeah, that's right. So it might that's make the sense, next step. Sean, if you can point Callie to the, the query. Exa where... Exactly what my next step was going to be is to okay, cool. point to the API. And then once we're in the API, 
we know So all of the API queries are under Augur API in the repo now. And they'll be either in the metrics or the routes folder, depending if it's what we call a standard metric or not. So first I'm looking in the metrics folder. It's not seeing anything with license in it there. All right. No, nothing in experimental. All right, so this one has license files. And where is the query? API metrics repo meta Okay. Metrics. So okay, licenses is under repo meta. All right, so here, for example, is a big chunk of uh, license queries. So line 457 and down for, for this. All right, that should hopefully help. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, I just want to try it out because there's a port. I'm going to see if something I'm... The thing that I was, um, once I was like reading into it, made it seem like it might not be um, like, that the tables that are necessary for this might not be aut automatically like quote unquote collected on um, um, out of the box. And that's what I wanted to look, look at. Yeah, I know that, uh, I know when we originally installed it, we ran the licensing worker. Let's I would see. have to check and see if I'm, I've run it recently. Yeah, because it's like whenever I put this into a, let me make sure, yep, auger data. So if I try to put this into my SQL um, editor, it says that none of those um, tables exist. None of those tables exist? That sounds like a permissions issue. Like maybe I didn't give your account uh, permissions on the SPDX schema. Oh, okay. That's what that sounds like to me, because they certainly exist. I promise you that. Sounds good. Um, let's see if uh, it might. I mean, might be able. I'm to just going to. I'm just going over to my database because it's like you can't install Augur without those tables existing. So. It seems impossible to me, but all right, the schema exists, the tables exist. So it's just a question of giving you access to, to your user. Um, um, it might be worth as well, like, I don't know where we want to put in the documentation, but documenting how somebody can go from like the eight, like where to look in the API 
um, documentation to find the queries. Cause I didn't know that the queries existed in the code somewhere. Cause if I knew that, like I would have been, I would have done that a week or two ago. Um, so you might be able so, to put it in the documentation. Right. So people can know how to navigate. Good point. Things I assume that people recognize, but maybe don't. Yeah. And Augur is relatively complex. It can be really hard to find things for those of us that aren't um, at Sean level familiar yeah. with the code. Yeah, I, I will say it's, um, it is a little bit easier now that everything is organized under this Augur directory and basically metrics and routes contain all the API queries. But saying that somewhere more prominently in the documentation would probably help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, did you have another question, Kelly? Uh, I was going to uh, let, um, there's some newcomer questions. So I wanted yeah. to. Okay. Hi, uh, how do you say your name? Tehus? Yeah, it's pronounced Tejus. Tejus, nice to meet you. Welcome. So your question nice was in you chat, uh, how do you contribute to Augur, where to start? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's two answers to that question. The first answer is if what you really want to learn is Augur, then probably the first step is to just install it and become familiar with the the nature of what it is to install. And then second answer, or the, and the, the next step would be to identify an issue that's flagged as a good one for first timers. Yeah, I uh, are... found the issue. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, actually I was having trouble installing Augur. Uh, do you recommend any particular setup or is it fine if I just do it on a, a WSL server? Um, the WSL server, that's the Windows Ubuntu backend, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I know, like I haven't used it recently. In the past, when I've had students use it, it seems to be Ubuntu, but it's not quite. And so some of the things that you expect to work on a regular, what I'll call a regular Ubuntu server, uh, seem to not exist on the WSL server. And I, what those things are has varied over time. So that's why I say I don't know the current list because I haven't touched it in a few years. I, but so I would say um, recognize that that risk exists. Yeah, because I was having trouble installing uh, Augur properly following the documentation. Yeah, and there certainly could be some WSL issues. That's been a long standing problem for lots of people who try to install Ubuntu things of any kind onto, onto that server, just because there are really strange little idiosyncratic things, like I said, that don't work. Um, it's, it's certainly Windows and WSL are the hardest environments to troubleshoot. And I think that's mm -hmm. true, Kelly and Don can speak up with differing opinions, but I think that's true across the board in open source, that mm -hmm. most open source tools just are a little bit kludgier at best on a Windows or WSL system. I don't know if so uh, should I do a clean Ubuntu install? You could, so short of that, you could see if you could get it running with Docker. What? Uh, Docker, have you used Docker before? Yeah, I have used Docker before. Not so, on Windows, but on Linux. Yeah, so, and I haven't used Docker on Windows in uh, quite a number of years, but Docker is certainly more consistent, and it's it, it's more consistent, I would say, than um, than WSL. So at okay. least the errors that you get are ones that others could help you with. Okay, so I'll try to use Docker and connect with you on Slack when yeah. I find an issue. I think I think that's the, a good next step that has the least impact on on you 
because having to install an entirely new operating system is kind of a big lift just to try something no, out. There's, there is uh, Ubuntu installed on my laptop, but it has a lot of errors in it. Like for some reason, uh, it won't update to 24 point, the latest release, uh, and it's stuck on 23 point something. Oh, well, so that you could be, I have experienced this before, this is off the topic of Augur, but uh, Ubuntu's uh, supported, long-term support releases are generally even numbers. And they don't always offer an upgrade path from the odd releases, which are generally not long-term support releases to the even numbers. So like when I had to go, I tried to go from 19 to 20 a number of years mm. ago and ended up having to simply give up because there really wasn't a supported upgrade path. I know others have had some success over the years, but generally going from like a, a an odd, not long-term support release to a long-term support release, you're going to have problems every time. Sorry. Okay. Like it, it's never going to be as smooth as going from like 22 to 24 or 20 to 22. Because when they, mm -hmm. when they, when they call it, they call it the LTS release, those releases, um, they provide a migration path from one to the next. And it's not an easy one, but it's a doable one. But with the odd numbered ones, which are not long-term supported, it, it's, kind of uncertain whether it'll actually ever work. Okay. okay. I'll uh, try to reset my Ubuntu, I guess. Yeah, you probably are going to end up having to reinstall from scratch yeah. 24. And then once now that you know this, just stick to the releases that have long term support, which are generally yeah, the yeah. even numbered ones. All right. Right. I have another uh, question. I find... Oh, no, go ahead. So if I find any issues, I can connect with you on Slack, right? Yeah, please. OK, OK. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Tissues. I was, nice I was curious um, what, your, what your interest in Augur is. Is it, um, uh, you know, are you interested in it from like, a, like, is your company using it? Are you a student and you're interested in learning more about contributing? I just, I'm just curious why, yeah. why Augur. I am a student. I'm in my final year of college right now. And recently, I finished my internship and currently looking to work. So meanwhile, I'm thinking of contributing to open source to upgrade my skill set. Awesome. Well, welcome. 100% welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've got more questions. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Um... I know I was actually, this is not a question. It's more of like a prompt. I think it would be good to talk about the new GitLab update and just the status of like, what's been good, what's been successful, what are we working on? Um, if that's been something that's been working towards for a really long time. And in my opinion, there's been a like, for the first release, I think that it's about as successful as you could expect a first like release for something this big to be. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just to, for the for the folks at home, not uh, yeah. who are watching this on video, so we've had support for GitLab for a while, but what we didn't deal with is all of the funky ways that GitLab URLs can be created. So on GitHub, it's pretty straightforward. First slash is an org, second slash is the repository. It isn't that straightforward or consistent on GitLab. So um, in order to support GitLab, we basically had to come up with a way to decode whether or not a URL is a repo. And the one, the one feature that we don't provide for GitLab, so I'll start with the, the missing stuff, is the ability to specify an org or directory, which those exist as like groups of orgs on GitLab, and then get all of the repos that are underneath it. And that's, that's because we haven't yet found a robust API that helps us detect what the thing actually is. Uh, whether it's a repo or an org or a directory. And so we just, you can basically enter any GitLab URL regardless of the nesting. And if it's a repo, it gets put in to Augur now, which is uh, a pretty, that's the, that's the big improvement, which I think has uh, unlocked a lot of Augur's capabilities for projects that Cali cares about that are inside of these directory structures, then orgs, then, then the repository. 
tell me if um, that's about right, Callie, or if I'm misstating anything. Yeah, I would say just in general, like, I think that it's more than anything is that, like, for me, I didn't even under, before you're saying that, for me, like, GitLab hasn't worked before this because there's so many, like, so many of the GitLab repositories are in that funky URL structure. So there was, like, no way of knowing that it was actually, not no way, but until we knew that the the nested URLs was the problem, it just seemed like GitLab didn't work <laughs> because uh, it was the one thing that was kept on being tried just by, it was just the coincidence of it. Um, and so, but I think so far the transition, like seeing it in 8-Knot has gone relatively well. Um, there's definitely, there's some small like fixes needed with like the PRs, like timestamps, um, and we're like kind of going down the list and figuring out, okay, what isn't working? Why isn't it working and going through, but I think so far things are going pretty well. Um, well, and that's, it's yeah. helpful that, um, oh, sorry, I'm, uh, Adrian Edwards just made a comment. I don't know who Adrian Edwards is, but sorry. I Adrian Edwards is, so he's right, because he's going to be, Adrian Edwards will be on my team in May of 2025. Um, so he will be a software, y'all will be seeing his name a lot. I would expect you'll start seeing, um, like you'll um, start seeing him a lot. And I don't know how involved he will be between now and May because his internship is about to end, but he is going to be full a full-time software engineer in May, as well as the software engineer that will be coming on sometime in the next couple of months. So by May, we'll have two software engineers on the OSPO, Red Hat's OSPO data science team that will be working full-time on Augur and 8 Not. So that is when? something by May of 2025. Cool. Oh, the end is near. That's awesome. The end is near. We we probably want a different catchphrase though, because usually the end is near is some guy on a street corner with a paper cardboard sign claiming it's the end of the world. So um our, our oh, I actually I actually think what, what he meant with this comment is those check your local time links, all of them wrong. On, on our meeting notices. So I just deleted it because oh, sweet. You've, it, you said what time zone it's in, and we can all check our own local times. Those those links yeah. are really key. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't even know yeah. where they came from. I never clicked them because I live in I think Central people time. didn't know where they came from, and they just copied and pasted them from yeah. other documents, which meant that the, <sighs> the times were wrong in a bunch of the documents. Because somebody because nobody knows what they are, and so people were just copying and pasting them, and they were specific to each meeting. Oy, and okay. the time, <laughs> date and time of each meeting. Wow. Uh, well, that's. Uh, so I've that's, just been deleting them because I don't think they're helpful. That's kind of funny. That's uh, funny and tragic. So, so one thing I was going to say about the GitLab stuff, Callie, is that it 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 is working uh, and being very consistent with the GitHub data because effectively, GitLab and GitHub really don't have any stuff that they record pertaining to activities around issues or repositories that's different or novel. All the stuff they report or record is conceptually the same. And so all we do when we map a new Git Forge API is identify logically where that oh, data yeah. exists in our current table. So our table is called pull requests, which if I were to go back in time, and chaos had settled on the name for, I think we call them merge requests now or change requests. Change requests. Yeah. So, but chaos, it, chaos, Augur was like four years old when chaos finally settled on that terminology. So our, our tables aren't named as generically as the Augur metrics themselves, but the concepts are a merge request on GitLab and a pull request on, on GitHub. We all know are effectively the same thing. So that allows us to just map stuff into the same table. Yes. Um, the answer is most likely no, but I was curious to see if there was any updates on like the repo general information. Cause I feel like these are like the things where it starts to get a little bit hairy. 
You say um, repo general information. Can you or I can I that? can do so. Uh, if I want to go a few things that we can link to. So what I'm referring to the most directly is the visualizations that go on eight knots um, repo overview page, but which includes um, we've like some of them I know because we've talked about it. I just put it in chat. So it has um, life, it has GitHub um, file language information, package versioning, open SSF scorecard and repo general information, which is usually from the repo info. Um, yeah, yeah. And so this is the page that doesn't, that works the least with GitLab stuff. Um, ah, okay. So, so the repo info data is not populated for the GitLab stuff. No, it's, yeah, it's not populated. That Remember that we talked actually, about like the SFF yeah. scorecard with like a general bug, and oh, I do have uh, another thing I want to talk about about that too. But so the uh, are we getting scorecard data that you for GitLab repo? Inkscape is a good is a good um, yeah. I usually use Inkscape. Inkscape that's right there is a good. Um... Okay, so. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me take a look at that. All right. So I, I so I know like I know the repo info is like a metadata gathering catch all. Uh, it's entirely likely that we don't have anything collecting that data. However, I still would expect the commit data to be recorded and that all those repos could still be scanned. So I have to figure out what's going on there. Sounds good. Um, this kind of brings up a, transitions well into another topic. That's general eight or general auger stuff is like how to do with the SSF scorecard. Um, I don't know if this is so with the SSF scorecard for what I have seen, there's only been one set of scores for each repository. And so I don't know if it's a situation that it gets overwritten each time it runs, or if it's just I've only seen repositories where that has been run once. And so that would be the first part of the question. And then the second part is what behavior do people think should be the case? I have opinions. Well, the fastest way to validate if there's new data for every run is to actually just look at the data. Um, Because I knew that there was some bug that y'all were also working with whenever it came to that we did um, the fix. Scorecard. Yeah, we did fix. There was a bug that lasted, uh, depending on when you updated Augur, it may have never even shown up or it lasted about three weeks. Um, yeah. They, they changed. I think I explained this to you, but, but I'll explain it to the rest of the people. Uh, the parameter dash dash repo was the command line parameter um, for scanning a local repository uh, and the OpenSSF scorecard team just changed that. So uh, dash dash repo became uh, collecting data from a URL and dash dash local was the, the new command for the new parameter for scanning it locally. So uh, once um, we realized it had stopped working, then we, we went and figured out what went wrong. As well as just loading up my, yeah. with the, from what I've seen, long. it's only been once. Um, 
and I would argue that I think there's a benefit of it running of it being stored each time. Um, one, it stays consistent with some of the other similar, like the file, like the files table or the file or the licenses. There's like pretty much those type of tables. They run and store each time. Um, yeah. So you just need to select the most recent ones. And so that would be consistent with some of the behaviors of other similar tables, as well as talking with some other, the, some of the more security experts I've been working with. Um, they do see a value in having, being able to see dramatic changes, especially Story, other scores yeah. of the score. So if you can see the score over time, you can see if something's been dramatic. Like it's a lot easier to see some pretty dramatic changes or a steady change over time. No, it's for, it's fairly clear to me just looking at this that it is we are storing one we are storing the most recent recent scan, and not not a historical record of scans. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's, first that's pretty clear. So I've been sorting okay. by repo ID. Uh, I've got the nineteen records for each of the parameters with the corresponding details in a JSON structure and the scores and yes these are absolutely not there's only one there's only one full record for each each um repository so that is the way it does work for sure okay so how that's how it does work is it how it should work is is, is now is now the question yeah Yeah, I mean, we can, so the two things I would say about keeping a history. Um, the first is, I mean, I think it's a good idea. We keep a history on some of the other files, like the repo labor table has a complexity history in it and we keep it there. So uh, personally, I like the idea of having the history in there. Analytically, there these challenges are probably lower now than when we first added the repo scorecard to Augur. At, at the beginning, the actual data that was in the scorecard was changing monthly or even more frequently. So one of the reasons the details are stored in a JSON structure is because that piece is what was changing constantly. And so doing comparisons over time, you may not get exactly an apples to apples when you're looking out over like a period of years. However, I also think that scorecard has matured a lot in the last couple of years, and it's probably changing the data that it captures a lot less frequently than it used to. So I agree. That's probably it's probably not a real issue today. Um, would, and then so I think yeah. it's, and I think the uh, the changing of it would be as simple as simple quote unquote as uh, going to the tasks folder under Augur Augur. And looking at uh, these are Git related, and yeah, I do think it's a lot more stable, and I think it is something that's good. Of like, if we're gonna keep like a really like comp like um, compressed aggregate history of like project health right now, like I think the um the open SSF scorecard, keeping that over time is a really easy way to get some pretty good context of how things are going over time. Yeah. Yeah, and having that JSON information is really great. I've been yeah. I've been using it. Um, it's just yeah. it's, it adds a lot more context than just the score. Yeah, and and our original design, we were actually trying to keep everything in a discrete field, but like I said, it was changing so often that that became an un unsustainable. Um, so I'm just I'm looking at our logic here and. 
to me, it looks like our intention is to keep all the records because I see append as a command. Repo depth scorecard. All right, I might have to dig into this. It looks like it's part of a larger dependency chain. And so that my guess is somewhere wherever repo depth scorecard gets uh, put in, it um, it's actually doing an update and not an append or insert. So sounds good. Would you like me to so, open an issue? Yeah, or... that would be that'd be great. I think I think that would be a really that'd be very helpful because then I can just like the issue that you raised a few weeks ago uh, and put on the the roadmap page, um, not in a category that kind of helped me push that forward with the auger group. So yeah, I think creating issues and being able to talk about them that way is very helpful. So I've got that as a goal. And Oops, this is a goal. Oh, I did write, oh, I have an issue. The question, okay, let me, let me edit. Um, okay, I'll let you see if this issue fits or not. I opened it a couple of days ago. Nice meeting you, Altaïus. Yeah, yeah. That's in the queue. Thank you, Kelly. Absolutely. Um, for the repo info one, do you want me to open an issue for that? Also, that would be very helpful, yeah. Okay. And repo info is kind of a, it's an internal auger reference, although it is kind of self-explanatory because it's all about repository metadata. Uh, but we have one worker that goes and gets it from GitHub, and I expect I expect there are similar API calls that can be made to GitLab. Maybe not one single API call, but I mean the things that yeah. we gather there are not they're pretty commonly requested data. Like in fact, they're like things like stars and forks and I see it contributors. And this is like where I expect there to be a little bit of a like just like these are the areas between um, different platforms that I expect to have some like um massaging necessary like this makes sense to yeah. me All right, uh, anything else uh, we want to throw into the agenda today? 
I think I'm, I think I've got, I, I, I have taken over the meeting enough. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it's actually pretty helpful. Anybody that would tune in and watch this would would learn a yeah. few things. And like I said earlier, any question you have is going to be a question mm -hmm. that somebody else likely has. So I think it's yeah, all I think I'm glad time. that we have like some time just like popping through the auger code base on a video. I mean, for me, it's like I've learned a lot. I've been working for with auger for years, and I just learned yeah. a bunch more about how to navigate auger and so i think this is like a like helpful yeah. going through things yeah i think i think i got trained in the chaos ways of not getting too technical early on and i just need to remember there are actually times where it's appropriate to use technology this... code words <laughs> right this is this is yeah. the auger eight not meeting yeah 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 actually speaking if there's if there's like nothing else happening um i i did want to kind of jump in because i think i know i uh, i've recently been starting to kind of get into some of the good first issues on the eight knot repository um and i think i just i think i just recently landed the one just to like put the the last updated dates like the when the, the date when the data was collected on the repo scorecard and repo info boxes um but I think um, I was kind of curious uh, I, I think i was actually planning to try and grab some time on your calendar Callie, to, to kind of discuss like what the next steps are like the future of like what what i could be doing next to to be helpful to eight not nogger um so i figured i figured that was kind of a yeah. perfect i mean that seems like it lines up with like the first timers yeah. get them in the agenda anyway so yeah it's gonna be purely based on like you tell me how much time that you have to con like what is your time window how many like how long and then how much each week and then that would really determine where i'd point you so I know that you have like you have like a bit with the intern. Yeah, just trying to figure out the timing of stuff is really going to be what determines where I point you to. Yeah, so I think um, I've I've got a pretty short timeline until the end of my internship, and then I have I have like a semester off, and then I start I start red I start kind of full time kind of probably mid July ish. No, uh, okay. June. Um, okay. So uh, I I might I don't know. I feel like I'm feeling a little bit more confident. Like, I don't know if I necessarily want to take all of the good first issues. Um, like, I could probably tackle something a little bit bigger, but I don't know, maybe not going too big. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be the hard, that's like the slight problem with where we're at right now, because since we have like so much that has had to get paused, that like getting something that's like slightly bumped up is a little bit difficult. It'll just be like a lot also based off of your experience. I would look into the issues around the um, search bar and talk to James Kunkstel if it ends up being interesting. I, if you have enough time to do it, that'd be really helpful to like work on. Um, and I think that would be like the next like larger chunk thing. Um, a smaller chunk thing would be um, like working on the similar, um, the SSF scorecard one and adding on the um, descriptions from like, cause there's a score and there's like an idea, like there's a JSON we were talking about earlier that has like the description of why that score is the case. And so I think that we want to add the explanation on to eight knot. Um, so that would be something smaller, similar to what you have done before. Search bar would be a little bit of a bigger thing. Um, yeah. But definitely anything that's in the like on deck column for eight knot is great to work on. Even like some of the documentation stuff that James did. I think um, before you leave, like or before your internship ends, talking to James Kongstol is like a big would be a big um, portion of it because he's going to be the he's our he's the predecessor and kind of is the one who's left. He has lots of thoughts and ideas about what can be done with eight not where it can go. He's just no longer in the role. Yeah, and I think also um, my time's a little bit split with Boot C right now, obviously, because like, yeah. I'm doing that for independent study, and that that's actually the independent study portion of that is going to extend beyond the end of my Red Hat internship. Um, so I think I also might be able to get like justify some more time towards this uh, if I can kind of overlap it with that. Um, so and I, so I think one of the things I was actually talking with my supervising professor about was like I, I was kind of originally planning like do a bunch of interviews in the community and then kind of see if there's like a bit kind of 
a big project that's not like hold on to the rocket ship for dear life, like try and get up to speed really quickly kind of thing. Like just some should, like do a big document. Should I stop the recording? Um, oh yeah. But you I can. think it turned out